Afghanistan, the site of the U.S.'s longest war, is still very much a nation racked with violence and bloodshed. Despite pockets of calm and oftentimes appearances that life has returned to normal. Dr. Esmatullah Esmet is no stranger to that violence and bloodshed. He fought to keep the fathers, mothers, sons and daughters of the various sides in war alive as a surgeon for MSF, or Doctors Without Borders. Esmet was based on what many regarded as a crown jewel medical facility in northern Afghanistan's Kunduz province. It was a very good hospital for um, all peoples. All the service, services was, were free for peoples, and they accept all kind peoples. There, there was no difference between rich and poor, and civilian army. Doctors Without Borders negotiated its ability to function as a neutral healthcare facility with the Taliban and Afghan government and treated wounded combatants on both sides, provided they left weapons and war at the hospital's door. The Afghan military took control of the region as the U.S.-led NATO combat mission ended in the country at the end of 2014. The U.S. and its international partners continued to play a role in support and training, but their intelligence gathering capability was significantly curtailed after the handover. In late September 2015, the Taliban launched a surprise attack, capturing control of Kunduz city within hours as Afghan forces quickly and fully retreated to the city's airport. A U.S. Special Forces team was called in to help, and after beating back the Taliban at the airport, it launched an offensive to take back parts of Kunduz city with various Afghan forces. In the early morning hours of October 3rd, Afghan commandos requested U.S. airstrike cover for a raid they were planning on an intelligence building, which had been taken over by the Taliban, not far from the Doctors Without Borders facility. A series of breakdowns followed, including equipment malfunction, a verbal description error of the target site, and a failure to relay the coordinates of the hospital as a no-strike zone to the U.S. gunship. The confluence of these events was catastrophic. When I hear a big blast sound, uh, I wake up from sleep. All the glasses was bricked and fallen down on the floor and on me, and there was dust, smoke around inside the room and in the corridor. I broke the windows and I jumped from the window. I found a small hole and I sit in this hole. After the first U.S. bombs hit the hospital, Doctors Without Borders staff contacted both American and Afghan officials, but the attack continued for another 30 minutes. Dr. Esmet and his colleagues struggled to stay alive. With each blast, there was a big dust, smoke, and we think we will die soon. All our friends, at first they got injured, then they died, then they burned in the fire. The attack on Kunduz was a sustained attack over an hour, despite the fact that all the, the parties knew us at our GPS coordinate. We must say that it was our bigger loss in terms of lives. 42 people died, 14 of our staff. Kunduz attack was so devastating because just months earlier we had seen a hospital that was providing really care at a tremendously high level, uh, really complex surgical procedures and care. And to have that destroyed was also had a very, I think it's fair to say, quite a significant psychological blow for us as an organization trying to provide care on the front lines. Hundreds of thousands of Afghans have lost access to the healthcare facility since it closed after the attack. Doctors Without Borders won't restart operations in the area until it's confident its sites will be protected.
The U.S. Department of Defense initially stated that an airstrike to defend U.S. forces on the ground may have produced collateral damage to a nearby medical facility. But weeks later, the Pentagon confirmed that a U.S. AC-130 gunship had in fact attacked the hospital. This was a tragic mistake. We had, we thought, all of the proper procedures in place in order to avoid something like that. And certainly the, the pilots, every, every soldier, airman, uh, is instructed uh, on the, uh, issue, the law of war uh, and what targets are legitimate and not. And so clearly something had gone wrong. All members of both the ground force and the AC-130 air crew were unaware that the aircraft was firing on a medical facility throughout the engagement. In its final report, the Pentagon reaffirmed that the incident was an accident and was not a war crime. Sixteen members of the U.S. military were disciplined, twelve personnel were suspended and removed from command, received reprimand letters and extensive retraining. I am satisfied that the military is being held accountable for these mistakes. I'm not overjoyed, very frankly, that some of the higher-ups have not been disciplined. But I put it in a very different category than what we've seen from the Russians, from Bashar Assad, and from what we've seen in other conflicts. The U.S. government has, has definitely gone through a thorough investigation. We, of course, would have liked it to be a little more independent. MSF, we're not impartial. We're the victims. We can't possibly be impartial in this circumstance but nor can a certain way of investigating these things solely through the Pentagon. Although some have criticized the investigation for not being independent, many have been encouraged by the Defense Department's review of its policies and the creation of a statement of principles in the wake of Kunduz to protect medical care provided by impartial humanitarian organizations and its improved contact and coordination with aid groups. We realized uh, that we needed to improve our communication with the NGOs on the ground. The statement of principles was, was basically just that. We tried to eliminate ambiguity where possible. We tried to make sure that they had an understanding of the way we approach trying to make sure that we uh, are able in the midst of a combat zone uh, to respect international humanitarian law. And uh, that, that exercise, I think, was good for, for both sides. They have been changing. I think that we've seen more outreach from the military. We've, been, we've seen more education uh, that the D Department of Defense is doing, actually, for their military uh, commanders, as well as inviting more NGOs. We've been invited to certain uh, discussions that we were never invited to because it used to be just military. We've seen even the U.S. military taking that incident very seriously and, and disciplining people and putting systems in place to avoid such an incident in the future, which is very encouraging. And I wish other military actually would do the same. However imperfect, the Department of Defense demonstrated considerable resolve and seriousness of purpose in dealing with the Kunduz tragedy. And some good came out of that. We're likely to see more instances like Kunduz in the future as aerial campaigns continue. We need to work hard to guarantee and strengthen the transparency of U.S. operations and improve the trust and confidence of the NGO sector. The legacy of Kunduz and the continued debate over it will, we hope, guide future U.S. action.